pretty true, isn't it? And um, we have to laugh through moments like that because it hits pretty close to home. It is good to speak to you again today about relationships, and as we've spoken before, uh, I know that different ones are in different chapters of life, and um, as I have shared, that uh, I never want to apologize for preaching about marriage because of maybe offending those who aren't married. Um, I want to commend those who find their identity in Christ, and that's for all of us. That's where we all need to find our identity in Christ, and the call that God has placed upon your life, um, would you just live in that call? And, um, and so I, I often say that during messages like, like this today. But once again, uh, every principle that I'm going to talk today, because it is the living Word of God, it's going to speak to every heart for everyone here. And so would you just allow the Holy Spirit to speak in a very special way? And so with that in mind, take your Bibles and let's turn to the Song of Songs. It's after the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs, and we're going to look at chapter 2 today. If you remember last week, we shared the goal of our marriage. It's to be in Ephesians chapter 5, husband, where Paul says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's the goal for marriage, for men, for how we're to lead the home, to give ourselves up for our spouse. And to love just as Christ loved the church. And remember, I shared about the ladies also. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 3, says, In the same way, I love those words, in the same way, their wives are to be w- women worthy of respect. That's a high call. It's almost a, an impossible call if we try to do it on our own. But with God's help, what an incredible thought there to be a, a lady worthy of respect. And so we talked about how do we attain that? How to, are we to be the husbands that God has called us to be, the wives that God has called us to be, the people? And we talked about four goals that need to be a part of our life, characteristics in order to reach the goal. Number one is to, to have a godly character, not just a good reputation, but to have a godly character. Character is who you are in this inside. Reputation is what other people think about you, but we're to have a godly character. We're to have growing trust. Growing trust between one another. And that happens when we're open, when we're real, when we're honest, when we're trustworthy. It changes everything. Higher standards. We do live life different. We don't make apologies for that. We're to have higher standards in every area of life, and especially in relationships, and consistent encouragement. That's how we are able to attain the goal to be an Ephesians 5 man, to be a Timothy 3 woman. Consistent encouragement. We need to encourage one another. Some of you asked me about the book that I referred to last week, The Married But Lonely. And I know that a few of you have ordered this because you asked me uh, specifics about it. Uh, This book has been good for me to read. It's not been easy, but it's been good because it's been eye-opening. And it is helping me as a man. Uh, the, the topics include the titles like this, The Man Who Knew Too Little, How to Be a Godly Man, How to Be a Romancer and a Leader and a Great Lover. I've known men who were served divorce papers, and they shared with me, said, Dustin, I didn't have a clue that anything was wrong. And I remember thinking, clueless. What went wrong? I mean, how did you miss this? You really didn't know anything was wrong? No, I didn't know anything was wrong. My heart broke for him. Because somewhere along the way, and maybe early in marriage, they had maybe set a target, but they begin to live life just maybe one degree off. Maybe your marriage is perfect. <laughs> probably none of us could raise our hands on perfect marriages. Most of us probably have a degree or two that we could make adjustments on. I read a story about a pilot that he typed into the, the log there on the computer uh, uh, the coordinates that he, for the airport that he was flying to, and literally one little typo, one simple degree, he was off. And for every mile that he flew, 92 feet, he was off. 60 miles was literally, I mean, as he, as he flew 60 miles, he was almost a mile off. And by the time he flew to his destination, the story says that he was 50 miles off and it became a critical point in the flight because he had barely enough fuel to get to the next airport. One little degree. And if he would have made adjustments along the way, it would have changed everything. 
And the reason I share this book is because I wonder if there's people, and maybe you have someone that you know in your life that maybe needs to make one little adjustment. I've not read every page in this. I've read quite a bit of it. Uh, But other topics include smiling on the outside but dying on the inside, how to speak the truth in love, how to make sure that your spouse, and speaking mainly to men, how to make sure that they're opening or that they're listening. Uh, One title is, How to Get Tough and Rattle the Cage, so to speak. Mm, That sounds kind of tough, doesn't it? How to have that honest, loving, truthful conversation with the one that you love. The reason I share this is because I just really believe that God is on our side, that he wants to see every marriage succeed. Do you believe that today? And my prayer is that uh, as we talk about some open, honest conversations here, that we would just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. That's been my prayer for this morning, because God wants the best for our marriages, and, um, and I, He makes it possible for us. Uh, let me just remind you, mark your calendars. Uh, two weeks from this weekend, right now, we're having a marriage seminar. It's a Friday evening and Saturday morning. Dinner will be provided on Friday, a brunch on Saturday morning, the mingling of souls. There's going to be four sessions that we're going to spend together, and so be sure and you can go online and register for that or sign up in the foyer there. But I want to just uh, encourage you to be a part of that. Well, let's continue our study in the book of the Song of Songs as we uh, look at this. As I shared with you last week, remember, this is a love story between a man and a woman, and it does get pretty steamy. And not only in the bedroom, but in the real life living. There's so much to process. I, as I was going through the book, I thought, oh, man, there's so many different aspects that I could preach on. I could spend a couple of months on this. Uh, don't need to do that necessarily. You can study the Song of Songs on your own. But uh, today, I want to just share with you two or three great lessons that we see through the entire book. As this couple falls in love, as the Lord brings their marriage together. And it's important as we think about that. People will ask me, and I've read about this, I've Googled, I've done some searching, but what is the number one marriage problem today? Is it the lack of communication? I think we could say that's probably a great problem in marriages today. Is it the lack of intimacy? I think that would be a great problem in marriages today. Is it the lack of time? Because we do live such a busy life. Is it the lack of time that pulls us apart? All of those are huge problems in marriage. But as we really begin to think about it, the problem in marriage could be brought down to one simple thing. And that would be self-centeredness. Probably the number one problem in all of life, isn't it? Whether you're married or not. Self-centeredness. In my devotions this last week, I was using a book from Henry Blackaby. And he referred to a scripture, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, where Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, here's what Jesus said, He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I think what Jesus was addressing here was self-centeredness among the disciples, self-centeredness that Jesus was saying, this is a problem. It's more than just a mistake, but it's a sin problem. When people get so centered upon their self, rather than allowing their lives to be God-centered, they become self-centered, and that's when problems arise. And it's a problem in life. It's a problem in relationships. And God has greater things in store for you and for me. And so somehow today, my prayer is this, the Holy Spirit would speak to our lives. Lord, speak to me. May I move from being self-centered to being God-centered. That's pretty good preaching, isn't it? To move to be God-centered in every area of our life, and especially when we talk about relationships this morning. And so to the book of the Song of Solomon here, verse 8 is where we're going to look at, and we'll get to the text in just a moment. Here's what the lady says to the man, listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. I googled what a gazelle was. The gazelle is like in a deer family. The young stag, a picture of a deer with large antlers appeared. The gazelle literally, they say, could run 60 miles an hour. A gazelle, you could think about A perfect body, being in the shape, able to run that mileage. 
And here's what the lady says, says, I see my young man bounding across the hills. <laughs> it's almost like they're, a song ought to break out at this time. The movie, it would be a great scene. Verse 9, my beloved here is like a gazelle, a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Verse 11, and this will be the text for today. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. You say, well, where are they headed with all of this? Well, they're headed in all directions with all of this. He goes on to say, the cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. It's a very romantic scene of a couple coming together. Everything's just perfect. The spring is in the air. The aroma is pleasing. They're pleasing to one another, and they are drawing close together. As I read this and began to ask the Holy Spirit exactly what is in store for today, there's two lessons that I want us to look at today, two seasons of life. The winter season says the winter is past, verse 11. Winter season is a season of preparation in life where the roots are growing deep. God may have some people in the winter season today, and sometimes we wonder, is that where we want to be? But I want you to just say to yourself, it's okay to be in the winter season, whether it's in the winter season of a relationship or in the winter season of living, because it's in the winter season where our roots grow deep. It's a time of preparation. And spiritually speaking, maybe God has you in the season that he has you in today so that your roots can grow deep. Your reliance, dependence is upon the Father, not upon people here on this earth. And it's okay when you find yourself in the winter season. It's not a bad thing. You can't have spring without winter. And what the writer is saying here is winter is a preparation. Winter is over. We're moving into a new season. But winter is okay to be in. Think about that with me for just a moment. Last week I shared with you Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and all of his unrighteousness, or his righteousness will come to us. To seek first the kingdom of God in every area of our life. And so first, if we had to make a point here, as we think about the winter season, no matter what season you find yourself in, winter is okay. And the first point is this, seek God first in everything that you do. Whether it's a relationship or not, seek God first. As we look at the seasons of marriage, as we look at the seasons of life, I want to talk about this winter season. And I want to get very specific because this may be for you or it may be for a son or a grandson, granddaughter. Maybe you're going to go from here and say, well, my pastor preached on this today and it's going to open up a conversation that you can have with someone because the winter season is important for us. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us in a very specific way. Those who are in a winter season, and let's bring it into the dating relationship. Let's bring it into the relationships today. There's three things that you have to limit if you're going to keep God first in your life. And the first one is this. You limit your time, especially in a dating relationship. You're going to want to spend every moment together. That's the natural part. But we've got to be careful. We've got to limit our time. Kara and I, we met at Mid-America Nazarene University, and it was a wonderful place to meet, the college campus, and living in the dorms, and all of that. And from the moment we met one another, wow, man, it just, the, the romance took place there. We wanted to spend time together. How many of you still have a landline at home? You know, some of you do. Boy, a few hands are going up. Do you remember the day of landline? Even in the dorm, we had landlines. So here's what the evening would look like. I'd walk her to her dorm, and then I'd tell her good night. Maybe a little later in the relationship, I kissed her good night, and then I'd go back to my dorm. And before we'd go to sleep, we'd pick up the phone and we'd call one another, <laughs> and we'd say good night one more time. The day of the landline, <laughs> we'd hang up, and, and oftentimes the next morning, um, I'd see her on the way to class. It seemed like the relationship just blossomed from there and there. 
But the fact was, the more time we spent together, the more comfortable we became with one another. And we realized because of the decisions that we had made for our relationship to honor God that we had to limit our time together. Um, If you are a a parent today, um, it is important for you to limit the time, especially you let your teenagers stay together as far as being, being together. And I just say that because it is important. Because as we think about this, God calls us to be honoring Him in everything, and especially in relationships. For us to not become so comfortable with one another, there is a time for that. But in the dating relationship, it is a time of preparation, the winter season, and we need to prepare not to neglect our friends, not quit our job, not spend all the time with this person, but to begin to incorporate them into our world, we get incorporated into their world. It's important. And God wants to lead us in this. And the fact that you're here today on this Sunday morning, it tells me that your desire for your relationship, desire for your children and grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, is for them to find a spouse to be equally yoked with. Important, isn't it? And the reason I mention that is because as you become incorporated into their world and them into your world, it's important to make sure that the things of God, the church, is the center of all of that. The reason that's important is because we need one another. I'd like for us to do something fun for just a moment. If you've been married 50 years or would have been married 50 years and maybe your spouse is in heaven today, I'd like for you to stand to your feet right now. If you've been married 50 years or more, or would have been married 50 years or more. Yeah, let's thank the Lord. Remain standing for just, isn't this incredible? You ought to be the ones preaching on relationship today. You know what it's like? It's not easy. But you have stood the test of time and you have allowed the Lord to help you. And I'm so proud of you. And the reason that we need to make sure that we incorporate... And we'll make sure that the church and the things of God are the center of relationships is because we need the encouragement. We need the examples that you are setting before us. I want my kids to see the example in your life. It's not always easy, but as you've kept your eyes upon the Lord, he has helped you and you have remained faithful. And I want to say thank you. Thanks for being a great encouragement and a great uh, mentor to each one of us. Let's thank the Lord today, folks. You may be seated, but we need you to help us. And so we limit our time. We limit our talk. Have you ever known couples who've gotten together and, oh, by the second date, they use the words, I'm in love with you. (laughs) How do they know they're in love? They don't know if they're, they like you a lot, but they're not in love. And sometimes we put too much pressure on the relationship by using the words too fast. And we need to honor God here. You need to help your kids honor the Lord here. And it's not by the second date that you know you love one another. Oh, you may say there's promising things in the future here. But you limit your talk. The third thing is you limit your touch. I don't have to spend much time here. You all understand, but lustful emotions can begin to take over and your dating relationship will go somewhere that God has not designed it to go yet. And this is a conversation that maybe you can take home and have with your grandchildren say, Pastor preached on this. I want to remind you of three things he said that we need to limit. We need to limit our time. We need to limit our, our talk. We need to limit our touch. It's important because as we want to honor God in our relationship, we want a foundation built upon him, not upon one another. We're setting aside the, the selfish desires and we're going to honor Christ. And so this is the season of preparation. It's the winter season that we're talking about here to honor God. I love this statement. It's often made in the financial realm with Dave Ramsey, but he makes this statement. Live today like no one else so that you can live tomorrow like no one else. And that's important in relationships as well. And so the winter season, we make sure that we prepare well. It's a word that you need to share with others. Maybe you need to share with yourself as you're in the season of preparation. The second season, verse 12, flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. Don't you love the way that they talk about the marriage relationship? It's a season of singing. 
Now, the couple that we had before us on the screen, part of that wasn't much singing involved, was it? And yet, the writer of the song says it's a season of singing. Um, And for the rest of pretty much the book, he talks about passage after passage, great detail given of how the man and woman, they meet one another's needs and how there is a season of singing here. I, I thought about this. I thought about the needs for emotional intimacy, where you are the Ephesians 5 man, where you are the Timothy 3 woman, where the godly character, the growing trust, the higher standards, the consistent encouragement is included here. It's a season of singing, the needs for emotional intimacy. In this book, it also talks about the needs for sexual intimacy. Sometimes I get comments from people when I talk about sex in church. And sometimes I maybe go too far and I use a little bit too much humor. I usually use humor to break the ice of an uncomfortable subject. But I can't think of a better place to talk about this than in the church. You see, the world talks about it all of the time. And there's too many wrong messages out there. We need to talk about it here. And as the song talks about here, this book talks about we need to honor one another. We need to meet one another's needs. And in a marriage relationship, God has greatness intended for us. And as we think about that, as we think about the areas that God has for us, I never want to allow anything to drive us apart. And as your pastor, I encourage you to make sure that God is first in every area of your life. As we've shared before, there's two areas that couples fight about. It's money and it's sex. Well, let me give you the the solution for money. We touched on it last week, but if you really want to make sure that that doesn't come between you, you honor God with your finances. And so you begin to tithe. You say, well, Dustin, you're throwing tithe in once again. Well, when you begin to tithe, here's what happens. It forces you to put together a budget that leads your marriage And then you don't live beyond your means, and God has a way of providing. And so don't allow finances ever to drive a marriage apart. Honor God, keep Him first in that area. The second area that couples fight over is sex. And so when we think about that, we need to communicate with one another. We need to talk about this. We need to say, this is what we need. And God wants to be the center of it all. He wants us to pursue one another. It starts way before you get to the bedroom. Men, the most romantic thing that we can do is do, to do the dishes. <laughs> you laugh, to help with the kids, to help out around the house. That's good preaching, folks. And the reason that it is is because it's taking self and setting it aside and saying, I want to honor you in every area of life. Conflict is probably going to arise at times. It's going to. That's just life. We understand that. It does for this couple. As much as there could be a movie written about this book that's in the Bible, and I love that it's in the Scripture for us today, but there are still times when conflicts arise. And the second thought I want to share with us as we talk about the, the season of singing is that God does want us to meet one another's needs, But also in the midst, when it does get tough, he wants us to honor him, even in the midst of conflict. This is good application for every relationship, not just the marriage relationship. But there's two causes of conflict. Unmet expectations, and fill in the blank there, unmet expectations. Here in chapter 5, we see that there's an unmet expectation. The lady is waiting for her husband to come home. She's staying up late, but he is late And he does not come home at the time she thought he was going to come home. He doesn't give a phone call. He doesn't send a text. He's late, and so she goes on to bed. A little later, he comes home, and he finds her asleep. And he had other expectations, thought she would be waiting up for him. And a conflict arises. It happens here in the Scripture. I'm sure that never happens in your marriage, where there's unmet expectations. But if you're like ours, it happens sometimes. And just as we saw in the video, and as you've experienced in life, whether it's a marriage relationship or another relationship, unmet expectations Satan uses to drive a wedge. And my prayer is that we begin to navigate this in a godly way, not to allow it to pull us apart, but to bring us together. 
And so you get into marriage and you just assume that your husband is going to do the things like your dad did them. Your dad was good at fixing things. Your husband's going to be good at fixing things. And then lo and behold, your husband's not quite so good at it. You thought your husband was going to help you around the house like your dad helped around the house. But he doesn't do it. Unmet expectations. You thought she could cook like your mother cooked. I had a great story this this last week about that. But she orders pizza. You like pizza, but ordering pizza again? (laughs) Unmet expectations. And if we're not careful, those unmet expectations can pull us apart. The second cause for conflict is self-centeredness. We've already spoken about that. I don't need to spend much time here. But we were born with a problem, and that problem is self-centeredness. I want my needs met the way that I want them met in my timing. That's what self-centeredness is all about. And when we are single, we're, we're often thinking that, okay, if I get married, then, then all of this will be okay. I'm a perfect spouse. I'm going to be the perfect spouse. But then once you get into the marriage relationship, lo and behold, it's not so perfect. Because... We're involved, and it's not as easy, and it's not perfect because we have a problem, and that problem is self-centeredness. Self wants to be first, and let's get very practical here. Because of this problem, conflict arises in marriage. Let's talk about this. How do we resolve conflict in a godly way? Three simple thoughts. The first one is this. We will respond, not react. Can I say that again? We will respond, not react. All of us would have to raise a hand up. If you could take some words back that were spoken that you never intended to speak, all of us would have to raise our hand up and say, I've done it. There have been times when we have reacted Rather than taking a step, maybe counting to one, two, three, to ten. Some of us need to count to a hundred. And to stop and say, God help me. I want to respond to the situation that I'm in, not react. That's how we overcome conflict. Number two, we focus on the good, not the bad. Do you have to talk about the bad? Yes, you do. But you don't have to focus on the bad. And if we were to focus on the good, seeing the positive in our spouse, seeing the positive in every relationship, I believe it would change the perspective of how we see things. God could help us as we restore relationship. Number three, this is important. We will talk, not walk. Too many times we walk out too soon. And if we were just to talk through then the devil would not have a foothold in the conflict that we're having. You see, how we fight will determine the strength of our marriage. And there's a great verse that I need to take you to, and you probably already know what it is. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, says, in your anger, do not sin. He says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, I understand you're maybe not going to be able to work through all of the difficulty or all of the conflict before you go to bed, but you make a commitment to say, okay, I'm going to go to bed. We're going to go to bed, not with a cold shoulder, but we're going to go to bed. We're going to talk about this tomorrow. I love you. I kiss you good night, and we will deal with this tomorrow. The scripture says, do not go to bed angry. That's good advice for us so that tomorrow can be a new day, a new beginning for us. That's what Paul says to us, and I believe that God wants to help us. And So let's get real honest here. This is where it all comes down to where we live. Yes, unmet expectations, self-centeredness are all problems in all relationships, and even in marriage relationships, probably especially in marriage relationships. But let's just bring it down. I wanted to give you good advice to help you in relationships, but it's more than just good advice this morning. I believe that God wants to do a work in your life and he wants to do a work in my life that it goes beyond just relationships, goes beyond good advice. But he wants to do a work in our life that would change every area of our lives of living. And the work that God wants to do for us today is he wants to take self-centeredness, he wants to take unmet expectations, he wants to take these things that are not totally the problem, and he wants to pinpoint the problem in our life, and the problem is this, we have a sin problem. 
I mean, let's just really bring it down to where we live. A sin problem in life, and when we allow sin to remain in our life, to hold us back, to break relationship, not just with one another, but most important with God, that is when we run into problems. That is when God is able, not able to speak to our hearts, the Holy Spirit leading us. You see, God wants to have a relationship with us so much so that he wants to lead us in every relationship here on this earth. And I've been praying for today. I've been praying, how do we finish the service? How do we close this message out? Yes, great advice on relationships, great advice on marriage. But what God wants to speak to us today about, I believe the Holy Spirit speaking to our lives is saying, okay, couples, okay, individuals, would you really surrender completely to the will of the Father today to allow the Lordship of Jesus Christ to overtake your life in such a way that the marriage relationships, that friendships, that every area of our life will be changed and that God would be served first in our life. And my prayer is this, that you would allow the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins as you confess to him, that you would allow him to save you from your sins, that you would enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, renew your relationship, and that you would not stay there where you entered into that relationship, but that you would begin to grow. And I believe as God helps us to begin to grow in him, as we surrender our lives to him, that God will do his sanctifying work in our lives that will change change things at home, will change how you handle your kids, will change er every area of your life. I'm simple enough to believe that God has the power of changing your life and changing my life. Do you believe that today? And I believe God wants to change us. And he wants to help you. And he wants to help me for our marriage, for our family to be the best that it can be through the help of the Holy Spirit leading our lives. And so would you do this with me today? Oh, there's some good notes that you maybe need to pass on to your kids or grandkids. But would you just pause for a moment and say, Today, God, I, ha I seek you. I want the best that you have in store for my life today. And that between you and the Lord, that you would do business with God. Would you bow your heads right where you are? I wonder, is there someone here today... that you simply need to pause for a moment and say, Holy Spirit, I want to surrender my life to you, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There's some areas in my life that I'm not happy with. Maybe there's some relationships that have not gone the direction that I want them to go, whether it be a friendship or a marriage. Maybe you wanted to buy this book, Married But Lonely. And all of these are real problems in your life today. But the truth of the matter is, it's not the problem. The problem is a self problem. And as far as it depends upon you, you want to make peace with God today. To say, God, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I'm going to surrender control. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to take up the cross that you have and I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to ask you to follow me, but I'm going to follow you. For those of us who are married, could we make a commitment today? to say I'm going to surrender myself and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ for everyone here would that be our prayer and today just between you and the Lord God doing his business would you honor him and would you surrender your life to him in such a way that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you? And if there's some steps, some action steps that need to be taken, some of these conversations may be dealing with conflict the way that we've talked about this morning. Would you put that into practice? But more than any of that, before you can start there, it's between you and God today. Relationship with Jesus Christ, he has in store for you. 
I just wonder, is there anyone who wants to raise your hand up? And maybe it's for you. Maybe it's for someone you know that you want to raise your hand up and say, I believe that God is calling me to surrender my life today. Maybe there's a relationship that you're praying for today. Maybe it's a son or daughter's relationship that you're praying for. Maybe it's your own relationship. Would you just raise your hand up right now? Between you and the Lord, I ask God to intervene and for marriages to be restored, for relationships with sons and daughters to be restored. Maybe whatever's going, for God to be first in every area of life. We surrender to you, O oh Lord. Many hands are going up across the sanctuary today, and the Lord knows exactly what it is, doesn't he? And so, Lord, as we surrender our life to you, for you to do the perfect work that you have in store, it's my prayer, Lord, that you would be the Lord of our heart, that you would sanctify our hearts completely, that we would move on to great maturity in you. And so, Lord, we seek your face today. And we know that your grace is more than sufficient to do this complete work in our lives. But it starts with a decision. And I believe people are making a decision today. So Lord, thank you. And we seek your face today. And we pray this in your strong and mighty name. And all of us say, amen and amen. I ask you to stand to your feet. Sometimes when you get up from where you are, it signifies a new beginning. And I believe God wants to do a new beginning for everyone here, that God has great things in store not only for your relationships, but for the relationships that you're able to touch. And my prayer is this, that we would go in the grace and the peace and the strength of what God has in store as we honor Him. And so have a great day in the Lord. God bless you all. Let's honor Christ. Keep him first. Have a great day.